thankful that Jesus is alive. Amen? And so we continue the theme of Easter. This is actually the second week of Easter. Uh, Easter doesn't end just because the day of Easter last week is over. Uh, we continue to celebrate Easter in our church. Uh, so we're in the season of Easter and the resurrection. And I'm thankful today for the season of Easter. I'm thankful most of all that Jesus rose from the dead and was victorious over the grave. And we can claim that today, but I'm also thankful that I can eat chocolate now. I don't know what you gave up for Lent, but uh, whatever it was, uh, you are clear now until next Easter. So today, we want to uh, turn our attention to the book of Hebrews, and we're going to be looking at chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. And we'll have it up on the screen for you as well. Let's uh, look at verse 1. Therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also <coughs> lay aside every weight and the sin that, so, that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him, excuse me, consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks. Amen. We are starting this study on uh, the, the idea and the subject, don't give up. And the idea here today, uh, the theme is uh, keep believing. As we think about this passage, we're thinking about a race. And it wasn't a 40-yard dash. Uh, some of us ran cross-country. I ran both cross-country and track. And track is more, uh, you know, they have the 40-yard dash, they have the 100-yard dash, they have a half mile, mile, and all that. But cross-country is... Uh, it's 3.1 mile, or at least it was when I was in high school. But then you have your marathon runners who run like 26 miles or whatever, uh, and some of them do all kinds of uh, different events like ride bikes and swim and uh, go through mud. And so there's all kinds of events like that. But I think the idea here in this passage is really the idea of a marathon. A marathon is where you kind of set your pace and you know you're in it for the long haul. So you don't start a marathon <clears throat> uh, by running at full speed uh, normally. I remember a race, uh, John, that we did, I think it was in Jenkins actually. And it was back in the day with the old golf course and I think the first mile of that was uphill. And so I took off at a, at a really fast speed, not really taking account for that hill. And by the time I got to the hill, the top of that hill, I was pretty much done. I mean, I was uh, ready to give up uh, because I had exerted all my effort. And so we understand that the Christian life is not a sprint. It is a marathon. And so we have to look out and look ahead at the long haul and understand that we're in this together. Uh, even in uh, track and field and cross country, you have a team, so you're not alone. You have a coach and you have a team and, and the points all count up together. So you get individual points, but you also get team points. And the writer here, we're not sure who, exactly who wrote this, but we know that the audience was probably uh, people who were, had been persecuted, people who were weary, people who were maybe scared. Not that much different than people today. So in the midst of this pandemic, what is the word that God has for us? The word is today to keep believing, to keep on keeping on. That we're in this together. And so there's a, a three or four things here that the writer encourages us to do in this race of life 
in this Christian race. And so the first thing that he tells us to do is to throw off the weights, to get rid of the weights. These weights hold us down and keep us back. And so he's saying, let the weights go. Anything that, that slows you down. <clears throat> now, today and even in the early times of ancient uh, biblical writers, they had races. Paul talked about races, and they're talking about a race here in Hebrews. And they would wear weights around their legs. They would wear those weights to strengthen themselves, to get stronger. And so they would practice with the weights on. But when the day came to race, you would take those weights off and lay them aside so that you would not be hindered by the weights. So what is a weight in the Christian life? A weight is anything that keeps you from being productive for God, anything that holds you back from doing what you need to do for God. So we're to lay aside those weights. What are the things in your life that are holding you back? What are the things? Is it fear? Maybe fear for some people. And that fear can paralyze you. The Bible says that God has not given us the power of fear or the spirit of fear, but the spirit of, of love and a sound mind. We have the power of love and of a sound mind. And we have to call on God. And, you know, I think of the disciples when they were in the boat with Jesus and Jesus fell asleep and he was at peace and a storm came and they cried out to Jesus, don't you care that we perish? And remember Jesus said, oh, you have little faith. Why do you doubt? Why is it that we doubt God's ability? I know that it's harder to practice than it is to preach. And I know when the news is bad, and I know when we see things happening all around us. But we must not forget that God is still in control. That He is still out there, and He's still in here. He's still with us. David said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for Thou art with me. God is still on the throne today. Nothing takes God by surprise. And so I'm thankful today that we can do that. So throw off the weight. Then he says something similar. He says, get rid of the sin that so easily besets us or holds us back. So a weight may not necessarily be a sin, but it can hold us back. But then there are some things in our life that can keep us from doing what we need to do for God. These little sins, it may just be one thing that affects our lives and keeps us from being effective. For the Lord. For us, you know, we're all different. And all of our vices are different. And, you know, for someone it may be anger. And, you know, it may be fear. But there's that thing that is our weight that we have to deal with. The Apostle Paul talked about the thing that I hate to do, I do. And the things that I know that it's uh, very difficult. Who shall save me from this uh, wretched man that I am? And he says, I thank God through Jesus Christ. And so today, <clears throat> the writer is calling us to lay aside the things that hold us back. To keep us from being what we want to be. You know, there's a lot of people I've known, people, and you probably do too, <clears throat> who have great intentions and great inspirations and great aspirations, but they never seem to get it done. And they're always starting something, but never seem to finish anything. And it's like <clears throat> they have all kinds of excuses. Well, they start a job or whatever it is. Well, I didn't like my boss or uh, it was too hard or uh, my nerves got the best of me. I mean, you could just name a whole bunch of things. But they always have excuses for not doing what they should have done or what they said they would do. And they have great ideas. They have great intentions. But they never seem to follow through with it. But we're in this race to finish, not just to start. And we want to finish, and we want to finish strong. And so, God is calling us today to lay aside those things that keep us from doing what we need to do. Fear will paralyze you. And whatever the sins, and, and it's not necessarily that there's some kind of moral thing in your life, but that, that there's something that's holding you back 
from being what you need to be. So lay aside the weight, lay aside the sin. And then he says, number three, that we need to persevere. By faith we need to persevere. We need to keep on keeping on. And the idea there is that we're in this race, we get tired, we get weary, and we just want to give up. We just want to throw in the towel. And it's so easy to do. And he's saying that we as Christians need to keep on going. Don't lose hearts. Be not weary in well-doing. For in such a season you shall reap if you faint not. So keep reaching for that prize. Paul said, I have not counted myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. I keep running that race and I keep reaching for the prize that awaits me. And that's why we said, forgetting the things which are behind me, I reach to the goal. And so that's what we're getting to. We want to keep going toward the goal, but we want to persevere even when the times get tough. Life is hard sometimes. And we have to find ways uh, to, to get, get our inner strength and to also find ways to, to uh, feed our souls. Right now, we're not able to come to church like we once did and sit in a building and be fed by the, not only the, the minister, but the fellowship of the people. There's something about coming together that, uh, that builds us up. The church edifies us. And when we're not able to do that, it's very difficult on some people. I'm thankful, again, for technology. But I'll be honest with you, I love technology and I'm, I love being able to reach out to people. And we're reaching more people than we ever did before because of technology. But it's still not the same. It's not the same as being able to look somebody face to face and say, I'm glad to see you. I'm glad you're here. And even walk up and, and just put your arm around their back and say, it's such a blessing to see you. I miss being able to do that. I miss being able to uh, connect with people face to face. Now, a lot of our young people, that's the way they do. They, they would rather talk online than they would talk face to face. And maybe that's the way our world is changing. But I, I maybe I'm old fashioned, but I still like talking on the phone. I still like that face to face connection. And I, I'm thankful for Zoom and I'm thankful for Facebook Live. But there's something missing. And so it gets hard sometimes and I get weary sometimes. And you wake up and you listen to the news and you turn on uh, uh, Andy and listen to Andy, our governor, and, and you hear, well, there's going to be a few more weeks or a few more months. And just like, oh, my goodness. Sometimes it feels like a dream. Like I went to bed and I'm in a nightmare and I'm going to wake up any moment and I'm going to tell my wife, I had the craziest dream last night. I dreamed that there was a pandemic and we were all isolated and everybody was in fear and, and people were dying. And But then I realized it's not a dream. It's not exactly a nightmare. It's reality. It's the world we live in. And people are hurting. And I know that there's people out there that may be uh, missing their loved ones because they can't hug their grandkids. They can't hug their loved ones. They can't reach out and touch because they're afraid they might catch this virus. So what do we do in times like these? I, I, I want us to find ways to reach out to one another. And Sandy and I are doing our best to try to reach out to our church. But we want you to do the same thing. To pick up the phone and call someone that maybe hasn't been to church and you, know, ha you haven't been able to see them in a while. And so reach out to them. Talk to them. Encourage them. Pray for them. You know, don't wait for the pastor to do it. Or don't wait for the pastor's wife to do it. You do it. But we're going to continue to try to reach out to you as well. So persevere. Don't give up. And then the fourth thing that we're encouraged to do in this race, we are encouraged to uh, look or fix our eyes on Jesus at the end of the race. Now, 
when he gives us this picture, he starts out by saying, Seeing then, therefore, that we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. And the word therefore points back to the previous chapter, chapter 11, of this great cloud of witnesses. And so the question becomes, what is he talking about there? Is he talking about that, that there's people in heaven, uh, in the grandstand of heaven, that are like watching us in this rat race of life and cheering us on? Maybe. Or is it in a figurative sense talking about the people of the previous chapter are our witnesses of faith and how to endure when times get tough? I think that's probably closer to what he's saying. Maybe both. But the thing he's trying to point out there is if you read the previous chapter, these people didn't have it easy. <laughs> these were people who were tortured. These were people who were persecuted, who had all kinds of obstacles in their way. <clears throat> and yet they persevered. And he talked about Abraham, who was called by God to go to a city where he had never been before. And God calls him and says, I'm going to make you a father of a great nation. And yet they were old and barren, not able to have children. And so sometimes God asks us to do things that may not make sense to us at the time. But Abraham, the Bible says, by faith, he obeyed God. Because he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. And so if you think about this race that we're in, and looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, think about the race. When I ran uh, cross country and track, there was not always a cheering like at ball games where you have a, a fan crowd. There was, no, there was none of that. But I always knew that at the end of the race, my coach would be waiting and watching to see how we did. And I could not physically see my coach with my eyes because we were miles away. But in my mind, in my mind's eyes, I could visualize my coach standing there at the end of this race waiting for me. I wanted, to be, I wanted him to be proud. And so the writer of Hebrews is saying, looking unto Jesus, you can't see Jesus with your eyes. But by the eyes of faith, you know that he's waiting for you. And all those who've gone before us are also waiting. I, uh, a few years ago, had the opportunity to take a ride on my bicycle. And it was a ride. And it took several days to do it. To ride uh, the, basically, the Daniel Boone Trail, the trace. Uh, I started in Ewing, Virginia. And rode all the way to Richmond, Kentucky, several days on my bike. And it, what happened was, this was an anniversary of actually Daniel Boone coming and starting uh, his settlement in Fort Boonesboro. And I found out through some research that one of my relatives have actually been with Boone on his conquest. It was Joshua Pinnock, and he was an axeman for one of the axemen for Daniel Boone, who settled Fort Boonesboro. Also, I had a cousin or a distant relative that I never knew and never met who was hiking this entire route, backpacking it. Well, I, I decided I was going to do it on my bicycle. Now, there's a route that's called a motor route that you can find that is the Boone Trace, the, the original Boone Trace. Most of it's actually highway now. You can find some original ground. But uh, I decided to do it on my bike. And as far as I know, I'm the first person to ever do it on my bicycle. And so I, I, there's an actual website on uh, Boone Trace 70, 1776 where you can find that. But this was in March. And so I had some nice days and some not so nice days. It was probably one of the highlights of my life, this trip. But it was also one of the hardest things I ever did. Because if you know anything about Virginia, Kentucky, you, you understand there's a lot of hills. And that's fine when you're in a car, but when you're riding a bicycle with no motor, it's very difficult. And so there were some days where I was really uh, exhausted. 
I remember one particular day where it rained the entire day. And this is in March, and I was cold. And from the time I left to the time I got to the destination for that evening, it poured the rain. And I was tired, I was wet, and I was cold. And then that last day was one of the hardest days because it seemed like I was never going to get to the end. And I kept paddling and I kept going. But the one thing that I knew, <clears throat> I knew that I was thankful for the trip, but I was so thankful that I was, it was soon to be over. And I realized that when I got to the end that my wife and my son Bruce would be there waiting. And I could go home. And I could meet my family and, and rest from my weariness. And so in my mind, I kept thinking about that. I kept thinking about the, the fact that they would be waiting there when I got there. And the fact that I could go home and be with my family and sit down, have a nice dinner, and just relax. And as I think about that, I think about this race that we're in today. And we think about the fact that there is Jesus our coach, standing at the line, waiting us, and he's cheering us on, and the host of heaven are cheering us on, and we're on our way home. And sometimes we want to quit, and sometimes we want to give up, but understand that we're on our way home. We're almost home. And for me, I don't know about you, but for me, that's wonderful news, that I don't think of it as the end of my journey. I think of it as I'm just going home. One of these days, this journey for me and for you is going to end. But guess what? We'll be home. We'll be home with Jesus. We'll be home with our loved ones. And we'll be home to celebrate for eternity. And we'll look back, yeah, and say, you know what? I'm glad we made this journey. But isn't it good to be home? To sit at the Father's table. And enjoy this wonderful meal with our loved ones. Let's pray. Father, today, we ask you, God, to help us. That we might be able to keep on keeping on. To keep believing. Even, Lord, when we can't see the end. Even when the puzzle, there's no picture and we can't seem to put it together yet. God, you know the beginning and the end. Help us, Lord, to keep that faith until the end. In Jesus' name, amen.